All right, let the fun begin. Here it is, packet capturing module one of our CPTZ course. So in this particular module here, we're basically talking about packet capturing. Now it's a term used for intercepting a data packet that is crossing or moving over a specific network. Now once a packet is captured, it is stored temporarily so that it can be analyzed. Hackers can also use packet capturing techniques to steal data that's being transmitted over a network. Now to do this, we need to have what's called our network card in promiscuous mode. All right, and it's a mode for the NIC card, as in your network interface card, that causes the controller to pass all traffic it receives to the CPU rather than passing only the frames that the controller is intended to receive. In a non-promiscuous mode, when the NIC receives a frame, it normally drops it unless the frame is addressed to that NIC's MAC address, or a broadcast or multicast frame. In promiscuous mode, however, the card allows all frames through, thus allowing the computer to read frames intended for other machines or network devices. Now, used to diagnose network connectivity issues also, but a malicious intruder could capture and analyze all of the network traffic as well. And again, this is very, very important. Not all network cards are going to be able to be put into promiscuous mode. And uh, when we talk about the MAC address of the NIC, we're basically talking about the physical address of that network card. It is unique in the world, and we need to be able to, of course, capture traffic that is not expected to go to that MAC address. So as it's going across the wire, we can pick it up because we have it in promiscuous mode, which again allows us to pick up the packets that are not destined for us, and we can read what the content of those packets are pretty sweet deal. Now for this to work properly we need to have different tools installed. Now a lot of your Unix uh, packet sniffing and network tools rely on packet capture library to function and Windows will as well. So many of these uh, popular Unix tools have been ported into Windows known as WinPCAP and it's PCAP and then WinPCAP for the Windows side. So the porting of PCAP to Windows is called WinPCAP as mentioned and is necessary for many Windows based network tools. These include Wireshark, WinDump, Cane Enable, Snort, ProDetect, and a few more. Now you're wondering probably, hey, wait a minute, uh, where do I get these tools and what do I do with them? Well, first of all, let's take a peek on where we can actually get some of these tools. Now obviously we can pop it into our browser and get any type of uh, scenario there, or we can actually go here to uh, PacketStorm Security. So we go to packetstormsecurity.org slash sniffers, which has hundreds of different sniffers. Let's take a peek. So here's packetstormsecurity.com. And um, it uh, here we have our sniffer section. And as you can see, we basically have, uh, in this case, Wireshark. We have Smart PCAP Replay, another Wireshark, NetSniff TCP Dump, different versions, uh, and so forth that we have available. Again, different versions of Wireshark and such as well. But again, these are just a few uh, of the many sniffers that we can use. Uh, so don't uh, think that Wireshark is the end-all be-all of sniffing tools. Uh, of course, we could use the uh, built-in ones that Microsoft has even on their systems uh, that you can use uh, or any other ones that are out there. Again, this is just one of the many tools, uh, sites you can use for this. Uh, another one we can go to and uh, by the way, if you do type in the .org, it will redirect. So let's say we put in the .org. As you can see, it will give us through to what we need here and take us to the .com. So, so to do that, we can go to the PacketStormSecurity.com website, as in PacketStormSecurity slash sniffers. All right, so we could go to the PacketStormSecurity.com website under PacketStormSecurity.com slash sniffers, which has hundreds of different sniffers available. So here's some samples of those. So we go to PacketStormSecurity.com, go pop in the sniffers there, and you'll see here we have different tools. Now these are going to be different versions. So you have a 1.12.6 for Wireshark, then .5 and so forth, but also some other tools out there like TCP dump uh, and so forth. So as you can see, it gives us lots of different ones we can check out. And, uh, and such. And this is, again, just one of the many sites that you can use for that. Now, another thing we can do, too, is go to uh, something like uh, seclist.us. Uh, and uh, this is also another site we can actually go for the up-to-date uh, 
type of tools that we want. So depending on what we're looking for and uh, and so forth. So here, packet sniffers this section here, and see what it comes up with for a packet sniffing. Now, most likely Wireshark will be on the top of the list a lot of times. So you can see here we have a T2 packet spammer, which is a Wi-Fi packet injection utility. Pretty neat. Okay. Awesome. Got one for Python. Right, Aeon, a network attacking tool for pen testing and so forth. So again, lots of cool things uh, that we can use. Event sniffer for Linux key logging. Uh, a lot of cool uh, things here that we can use. Again, uh, lots of different things here. So check that out, of course, seclist.us. And another one is called uh, insecure.org. Uh, and uh, within here, we have on the left-hand section here, the security tools, which we can check out. And then from there, we have the top 125 network security tools. And of course, we could also look this up via the sniffer section here and then see what sniffing tools we specifically have, like Wireshark, Cane Enable, TCP Dump, Kismet, Ettercap, and such. Right, And then we get, of course, some, some wireless stuff and so forth with NetStumbler and whatnot. So again, there's lots of different ways to get that, of course. Of course, you can also use your favorite browser, as in your favorite search engine, and uh, do a quick search on you know, packet analyzing tools and uh, so forth. Another one out there is, of course, uh, some freeware utilities like WinDump and TCP Dump and Wireshark, which, again, is very, very popular. Now, Wireshark is actually so popular that they actually have their own certification now that you can receive by taking an exam, and also they have an online course that you can take for that as well to help you prep for that. So it's a pretty sweet little deal, and uh, again, it's one of those things. And we will be talking about Wireshark here in just a moment, uh, a little bit more as well. All right, good stuff. So here, when it comes to a wind dump and TCP dump, now uh, this was developed by um, these four guys, uh, one, two, three, four, five guys, right? And um, anyway, I'm going to butcher their name most likely, but it's uh, Loris Diogani, uh, Gianarca Vereni, uh, Folio Arisso, uh, Gian Bruno, and Piero uh, Viano. Huh? And hopefully uh, that was all uh, pronounced somewhat correctly. But uh, there we go. We have uh, these five people, yeah? They develop it. Uh, the winner dump and the DCB dump. Uh -huh. You can also check it out at the tcbdump.org, uh, windpcap.org, slash windump, slash default HDM. And of course, it requires that you have the windpcap or your libpcap library to function properly. Right? So it's all combination of the such, and there you have it. There you are. It's always good to kind of shout out to the developers that came up with the idea, and there it is. So apologize for butchering the names if I had. But those are the guys and gals and so forth that are out there that have done this. So there they have it. Now, uh, some uses that we can have for TCP dump and wind dump um, is that, you know, we can go out there and do, for instance, displaying of the interface using wind dump minus uppercase D, as in Delta. We can use the interface by using a minus I. We can use uh, print out in ASCII using the minus A, uppercase. Log it to a file by using the minus W and then whatever the file log name is that you want to name. We can also read from the log using um, the minus R, file dot whatever log or whatever file that you named it as. We can also get verbose input, and in this case output, um, via the dash or the minus VVV, the very verbose, or be less verbose by using the minus Q. Or we can also limit the capture, for example, to 100 packets if we wanted to by using the minus C, uh, and then whatever, in this case, 100 for the 100 packets. Now keep in mind, yes, we this will run both for TCP and and, and uh, wind dump, uh, both. That's why we have it kind of staggered, staggered back and forth uh, for that. Get a screenshot of this. Uh, you can see here we have um, this actually running within PowerShell, actually. But uh, we can see we have some output there that we can uh, check out. And we'll be getting into some of this, of course, when we look into looking at... Um, you know, actually uh, going in more so again into Wireshark uh, and so forth along with that. And uh, again, as we've already mentioned, the, the commands are going to be pretty similar uh, and so forth as well. And uh, it's one of those things that, you know, it will work within, uh, of course, um, as you can see here in an in, in upper level Windows environment uh, as well. So you have your Windows 7, of course, your Windows 8 and uh, your 
2008-2012 servers uh, and so forth along with that. You can of course script it uh, as well which is pretty cool so when you go out there and you can script different things that would be awesome because scripting assists you with uh, getting things done quickly. Uh, the thing is though that kind of limits scripting at times is that uh, we need to know what the internal IP addressing is for us to really utilize the scripts, especially if we're attacking from a remote machine uh, and such. So we need to know the internal IP addressing scheme to really get uh, benefit of scripting. Now, once we're in or we're doing an internal audit, that shouldn't be a problem at all. But uh, just know that we are not just limited uh, to IPv4 and so forth as well. So we do have IPv6 available. And there are special tools we can use for that, which we'll mention later in the IPv6 section. So a lot of cool stuff there. Again, a lot of, lot of interesting things that can uh, pop up there and so forth. So again, um, here we also have, uh, of course, Wireshark, which again has been around for a very long time. And um, it's the world's foremost uh, network protocol analyzer. And the original author was uh, Gerald Combs and uh, supported over 100 programmers. Wireshark also has their own certification called the WCNA, and uh, the Wireshark Certified Network Analyst Program strives to test the candidate's knowledge and ability to troubleshoot, optimize a secure network based on evidence found by analyzing traffic captured with Wireshark. Now, uh, Linux and Windows friendly, the latest stable version is uh, 1.124, but that may actually be uh, 0.5 uh, available. Now, I actually have Wireshark here. It's the 1.124. Uh, version of that and we'll kind of show you some of the interface here that's that's out there on this and uh, and so forth it's actually pretty straightforward when it comes down to how we utilize and so forth we'll go through some of the menu options and how we can actually utilize some of this to make it best useful for your environment keep in mind it's not just for capturing data in regards to finding out if someone's using uh, you know, weak passwords and such, especially if the data is going through in clear text, which most likely it is, depending on the protocols that are used and the services that are running. And uh, yeah, we'll basically take a peek into some of that and uh, so forth. So again, you can check it out at the Wireshark.org website, where you can also get the training of the Wiresharktraining.com slash certification.html to get a little bit more information in regards to that. It's a pretty sweet uh, little deal overall. Again, when it comes down to Wireshark, it, it is the most downloaded packet protocol analyzer uh, out there. However, uh, they found that a lot of folks that have downloaded it do not know how to use it more than to 10% of its capa capacity. So they've come up with this additional certification to assist folks to get out of the you know, standard of 10% usage of the tool just by downloading it and running it and such. So as we can see here, uh, when we open up the interface, um, it's going to be pretty straightforward, right? We have our uh, capture side, right, which basically tells us our interface uh, list, and uh, we get to basically pick which one we want there. So if we look back at our Wireshark here, uh, you'll notice here uh, I'm probably going to go with uh, one of these and uh, either my local area connection or my local area connection 9 uh, and so forth and of course I can also go in and check out some of the different capturing options uh, and so forth so if you look here when I look at the capture options this will actually tell me what uh, what the uh, MAC address is obviously of all these and also what the IP addresses are and which ones are kind of active and such. So right now, this is my active one that's going on right here. And then I have also other options here where I can capture on all interfaces if I wanted to do that. I can also use promiscuous mode on interfaces, right? So I can check that uh, and such. I can also do capture filters if I wanted to. So if I wanted to just look up FTP or whatever the case, uh, I would basically you know just pop in whatever information here that I'm looking for or um, have the ability to actually uh, bring in compile filters, expressions, uh, and so forth along with that. And uh, again, it's one of those things that uh, is, is really sweet. We also have the ability um, to go in and uh, capture files names, as in the put in the name of the file, whatever you wanted to. So um, something like that. We also have the ability to go in and use multiple files so we can actually check that and then say hey we want to create a new file after one megabyte 
or after 100 megabytes, or if I wanted to after one gigabyte or something like that. So it'll then create kind of more manageable files that we have available uh, or that we could have available there using that. We can also do it uh, every so many minutes. So if we wanted to capture it for 12 hours, and let's say we wanted to take, uh, you know, we wanted to do a new file every you know hour or whatever the case, uh, we can do that. All right? We also have the option to ring buffer with, with however many files we want. Stop capture automatically. So we can say, hey, after so many packets or so many megabytes, uh, we then have the ability to go in and, and stop the capture. Uh, or however many files that we want and so forth. So again, we have a lot of uh, flexibility here in regards to uh, what we what we can do here, right, and uh, and such, right. We also have different display options and name resolution uh, options and so forth as well, and uh, and so forth. We can also go in manage our interfaces uh, and so forth. So we can get pretty detailed with it in regards to what we want and how we want uh, things to be shown within Wireshark. Uh, itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave the, the cap, uh, capture filter blank um, and running it on my local area network. I'll just go ahead and start that puppy up. And uh, as you'll see here, we'll have uh, some information going on. If I get some traffic going here, let's see here. Let's just do something like that. Oh, yeah. Of course, uh, once I have selected it, of course, I have to um, start it up, which I think I did. Of course, no packets captured. Um, so let's try this again here. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Refresh. There we go. We got some packets going, as you can see here. Uh, these are continually to go. Now I'm actually running this off of our wireless connection and such. So, and as you can see here, we got lots of uh, information and data and so forth, which will dissect here in just a moment. All right, so anyway, so while that's running, we'll let that run in the background here and capture, capture some data and check it out. So again, we've kind of looked at uh, the capture interface. We've kind of looked at the capture interface uh, here. We looked at the interface list and so forth. And uh, of course, we can go in, open up previously captured files, especially too, if we've done it in, uh, you know, if we've done a lot of uh, capturing and we wanted to maybe just see certain time frames or something to that effect that we have maybe captured. All right, some other things here, the general settings option here, of course, is um, gives us different layouts uh, of the columns and so forth that we can look into. And uh, we can also make other arrangements such as, uh, you know, fonts and colors and uh, name resolution and uh, the different protocols we want to look for and things like that. And it's again pretty straightforward, lots of check boxes that we can uh, go in and, and manipulate. So if we go in here, uh, let me go ahead and just stop that for a second. And uh, as you can see here, we have lots of options here. So if we go to edit preferences and such, and this is basically where we have uh, our options here for our general settings here for the default profile. Uh, let's see here. All right, let's try this way. Okay, so anyway, as we uh, mentioned, all right, so as we can see here uh, for our preferences and so forth, again, we have the options to uh, save window position, window size, and all that fun stuff, depending on your resolution you're using and things of that nature, and, uh, and so forth. We also have layout options that you can decide which layout you want the data to come in at and so forth, panel one, panel two, panel three, and so forth, and how you want that laid out. So again, pretty uh, straightforward there, the columns. Uh, you can also add additional columns if you wanted to. As you can see here, we get pretty involved there when it comes down to what exactly we want uh, and such. And this will, of course, assist you in finding things when you're using filtering and such. We also have the ability to go here and change different fonts and colors for different things that you want and, uh, and so forth. So we have the option, again, to go in and manipulate every single bit uh, that we want there. Also in our capturing, filter expressions, if we have any name resolution, uh, we can resolve MAC addresses and things like that, and, uh, and so forth, really, really sweet. Also printing option, how we want to print the postscript to a file. All right, and then we also have protocols and so forth. So we can also display hidden protocols if we wanted to. And as you can see there, we got a ton of protocols. Now mentioning protocols while we're at it, let me show you guys real quickly uh, a website you can check out. It's called protocols.com. And uh, this protocols.com website will literally give you information regarding any protocol that's out there. 
which is pretty sweet. So that means when we're going to a uh, trying to find out specific information regarding a particular protocol, we can just go to protocols.com. And then from there, pick whatever we want. So let's say we wanted to do TCP IP. And then from here, we have different layers and so forth. We can check out you know, the OSI model layers and so forth. And uh, we can also look at it via this way. So you can see here, we can say, check out the DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And obviously, it's not giving us anything here. How about ICMP? Oh, can't find that either. OK. Well, I know they've just made, looks like they just made some major changes in the way the, the, way the actual website runs. But uh, keep in mind here, it is a great utility, great resource for you to find out things about specific protocols uh, and so forth that you have available. Again, it's a pretty sweet deal, and it gives you, again, lots of good info. Uh, and so forth. Let's see here if we get the RFC. There it is. BSDR login RFC, your request for comments. And the request for comments, uh, what these are, are basically your blueprint of a particular service or protocol in this case too, uh, and how it works, um, and how it was originally designed and how it's supposed to work and so forth. And a lot of times what you can do is go through these and actually find loopholes uh, that you can then utilize uh, within uh, any attacks that you're doing against the specific service or uh, protocol or whatnot uh, that you have available. So again, it is protocols.com. Looks again like they made a little change here from previous thing that's not quite making it work as, as nicely as it used to. Um, but some of it is still uh, actively available. But, uh, you know, give them some time. They just did a little redesign from the looks of it. But uh, needless to say, good stuff. Again, it's protocols.com, and it gives you some good information there that you can check out and uh, and such. So pretty good stuff. Okay. Anyways, back to uh, this here with our Wireshark side of things. So we're looking into you know different protocols, as you can see here, lots of different ones out there. And we also have a statistics option uh, as well that we can check out and manipulate and such. So pretty, pretty cool, right? When it comes down uh, to it, we have a lot of uh, flexibility there on what we can actually look up and how we can manipulate things uh, within that. And uh, even as I mentioned before, too, when we, when we looked at some of these uh, options here, right, we have the ability to change uh, those additional columns, uh, as you can see here. Right? So the time, the source, destination, and so forth. So if we wanted to add something else in there, we could, let's say we wanted to do um, something like um, source port. Okay, let's say source port. Boom. Now we should have a source port option in here somewhere. Let's see, where did it go? So, so as you can see here, we've went through the general settings and so forth. We also took a peek at the column settings and how you can actually go in and manipulate what the columns will actually display uh, and such. So again, depending on uh, what you want and run, you can have that specifically for your specific environment that you can use and uh, manipulate how the data is actually represented to you. Pretty sweet little deal. Now, when it comes down uh, to the different panes that we have uh, available, obviously here we have uh, lots of options here. Of course, we have our menu options, our shortcut menus, uh, where we can click on uh, and so forth. We have our filter um, available here. Of course, the actual output of the data. We have the detail output here. And then, of course, we have the hexadecimal output here on the bottom that we can then uh, check out and, and look into. Uh, and such. So again, lots of uh, different things we can look into. Of course, you can manipulate this as well uh, within Wireshark and have the ability to change some things around, again, to fit it to your specific need. Uh, as we saw before, we have different layouts, like the one we've chosen here, the traditional one is just where we have one, two, three. Now we could have had it one, two, three option and so forth as well. And again, that, th those are some of the things that are just going to be more personal preference that you have when you're out there using uh, your Wireshark. So here we have uh, again the different capture options. Uh, we've kind of explained some of these already in regards to going through making multiple files, you know, of course calling it something, stopping the capture after so many uh, megabytes or so many minutes or hours of, of capturing and things of that nature. So we do have the ability to customize it as much as possible 
um, that we have available. So when we look at the shortcut menus uh, that we have, and uh, here kind of explained is the, the list of available capture interfaces that we have. We show us the capture options, the second option there. Start the new live capture with your shark fin there. R uh, stop running the live capture and then restart running live capture. Uh, we can also then use the closed capture file and reload the capture file. Find a packet. Uh, go to the packet with a number, uh, whatever number that we're looking for, and then also go to the first packet. Also, we have the ability to auto-scroll packets in live capture, resize all columns, edit capture filters, edit apply display filters, edit preferences, and then possibly show some help that we have available uh, there and so forth. And again, it's all available right here. Uh, a simple click over uh, will get you those options and so forth. Now the reason this is so big is because of the resolution I'm using uh, while recording this, uh, but just know that this should uh, fit very smoothly into your window without you know it having to be like this. So again we have uh, lots of options here available that we can use and again it's just personal preference on uh, what you want to use there and how you want to utilize it. So we also have the ability to open up uh, capture files and so forth. And of course, you could use your menu options here on top as well to do the same thing uh, with that. Again, lots of options we have available. So uh, we also have something that gives us uh, some additional information. Now here it's a nice little uh, scenario where we get to follow the TCP stream. And basically how this works is pretty straightforward is uh, once we have our Wireshark open, um, we can actually pick any particular one here. Let's, I'm just going to randomly choose this one and then do the option of follow the TCP stream. So I right clicked, went to follow the TCP stream, and then what it does, it gives me the output uh, in kind of like a, you know, in, in the raw format in this case, but I can also change it if I wanted it in different uh, formats and so forth, right? Uh, but in general, it's going to show you kind of an ASCII format, needless to say. But we can kind of see what happened here, and it's nice, it separate, segregates it and uh, shows us what it actually is seeing. And obviously here we see um, the coding that goes into the protocols.com site, which is where we went to. Now where this here really gets interesting is, is when you start uh, getting information uh, such as, you know, uh, information that is, um, you know, sent over in clear text and so forth. Uh, so if I would have sent over a username and password uh, type scenario, it would have capture that and then if I would have followed the TCP stream it would have then shown me uh, what that looks like and so forth. Uh, as you can see here it also gave us some banner grabbing information so you can see here it's running an Apache 2.2.3 Red Hat right and again this is what's going to the protocols.com website is where we got this information from uh, and such. So again this could be used uh, very helpful uh, for troubleshooting and so forth so if you have a user that's basically saying hey um, I, I try to connect to this website, but it keeps timing out. But another user is to get into the website with no problems. Uh, what's the issue here? You could use Wireshark in that sense to kind of go in and say, hey, let's see what's actually happening here. And then you can actually follow it step by step um, and see what is actually happening uh, in this particular case on this one user that's getting it timed out when he goes to the web page uh, and such. So again, there's lots of uh, different ways um, to look at the data and so forth. And following the TCP stream is definitely one of those cool ways to do it. Uh, especially too, if you are using, um, you know, different protocols that will uh, expose username and password information and such. And uh, of course, that's all kind of handy dandy stuff, right? When it comes down to it. And we have the ability to do just that, is to look at that information in clear text and then also, as you can see here, get some good banner grabbing information uh, as well, um, depending on, again, what we're, what we're grabbing and so forth. Okay, other information that we can also grab is this expert info information uh, and such. And what's really cool about this is that it gives us some really cool things. Uh, it's under the Analyze uh, option here, and go to Expert Info. And then here it gives us some information regarding some of the packets we've had. So currently no errors, no warnings. Uh, we have uh, notes, three notes here. We have a duplicate acknowledgement packet and it tells us the packet numbers that are duplicates in this case. Uh, this frame is a suspected spurious retransmission. Okay, and it gives you the packet numbers for those. And then, of course, we have uh, the frame is suspected retransmission 
you can see here on those packets. And of course, these are numbered, so uh, packet 681, for, for example. So we'd be able to go down to packet 681. Uh-oh, where's packet 681? So as you can see here, these are the actual packet numbers and such. So you can see here we have packet 50, for instance. So let's take a peek at packet 50, uh, for example. It's not showing us packet 50. It jumps around. And the reason it's jumping around is because we're still under this filter here. That's why, because we did the follow the TCP stream, remember? So if I take this out, you'll notice here we now have packet 50 available uh, and so forth. And on top of that, we also have packet 650 and so forth available here as well. All right, so sometimes just takes a little take a look at here because <laughs> as you notice here, I was not able to check it out right away. So, but um, again, it just happens. So there it is. There's that that scenario. So um, other things with the uh, information, of course, here it shows us any kind of chat information between the uh, capturing that's been done. It tells you, of course, what uh, particular packets uh, that we're chatting back and forth. Uh, with the server and so forth and any other detailed information. Connection established, uh, of course, here using SYNAC and SYN acknowledgements and acknowledgements and so forth. And it gives us, again, some additional ways to get additional information on these uh, and so forth. So, again, lots of cool info here that you can grab, again, using it right off of, um, you know, Wireshark uh, and so forth. So, again, they've done a lot of cool things uh, with updating their latest version and, of course, having their own little spiel there. Uh, that we have available now uh, as well. So other things too that we can do is also we can capture voice over IP calls uh, and such as well. And uh, again, the option here is just go to telephony uh, op menu option and then choose the voice over IP calls. Now, obviously you'd have to have uh, VoIP working on your network for this to work properly. And uh, it will accept the majority of uh, the voice over IP uh, scenarios that you may have available. So it's, again, a pretty cool thing because what you can do then is you can actually capture those and then from that you can replay them uh, and such, which is pretty cool. So you have the ability to save those files uh, as WAV files and such and then replay the entire conversation that went on uh, and so forth. So if you have a network where you can do this with, then uh, you know definitely check it out and see what information you can actually grab and what type of phone calls you can uh, capture and so forth as well. It's pretty sweet when it comes down uh, overall. Here, uh, SMB, uh, sort of metric block uh, export. And uh, this here kind of goes into whenever you're using uh, ports 139 and 445, which is uh, 445 is generally going to be your SMB um, over TCP. And uh, what it does is it comes up anytime you have uh, file and printer sharing enabled. So uh, these are going to be your file shares and so forth that you have available. So once we see that, we can actually export uh, information that's maybe been uh, transferred uh, from file sharing uh, type scenarios. So what then that allows us to do is we can export specific documents and so forth that were actually utilized when someone was connecting in to that uh, shared directory or whatnot. And then as, as they were transferring data over, we can actually grab that data and then reconstruct it and so forth, as you can see here, uh, using the SMB export uh, type scenario and such. Now you do have, a, when we do the lab portion, you'll have an opportunity to try this out. It's actually really cool, uh, especially too if you get to try it out there in your real live network uh, and so forth. You're not going to be breaking stuff, but just make sure if you are trying any of this out within your, within your in production environment, make sure that you do have permission to do so. Very, very important to make sure you have permission to do so. Now, once we have, uh, you know, again, some of these different options available to us and we're utilizing those, we can also export it uh, via HTTP. So you can do HTTP export uh, as well and uh, and such. And uh, again, it's, it's uh, just like with your SMB side, but here we're using the HTTP, your hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, side of things, right? And then from here, we're able to actually look at things just as we saw with our um, follow the TCP stream. And then we can actually save that uh, as a file that we can then open up uh, as well. So here we can uh, save it as a PDF file, for example, and then throw it up into our uh, wherever, in this case, our desktop, and then be able to view 
uh, it from there. And then that's what that would look like, right? So we can export that and voila, have us actually check out what was being uh, accessed and things of that nature. And it's uh, again, pretty nifty, fun little thing. All right, now this kind of takes us to the end of module one uh, in regards to uh, looking at packet capturing and so forth. Now, uh, keep in mind though, the best thing to do is to download, install the latest version of Wireshark and try it out and see what's actually going on when we're looking at these, uh, this information and so forth. Obviously, as you can see in this particular example, is uh, that we're getting a lot of information such as the interface ID, encapsulation type, Ethernet or whatnot, the arrival time, the, the time shift and so forth, if there is any. Uh, we have what's called epoch time. Um, we have what's called the delta from previous captured frame and uh, displayed frame and such, time since referenced or first frame, frame number itself, the, the frame length, capture length and so forth, right? coloring rule, etc., etc. Right? We also have destination information, source, and here's where we get into some more other things that are typical to a packet capture analysis is looking at the internet protocol, what version it's actually running uh, and so forth. So you can see here it's saying uh, 45 here, which is actually indicating that it's version four. Um, and this first couple of information is actually going to be the destination uh, and the source and destination I, uh, MAC address uh, and so forth. And we'll talk uh, more specifically in, in some of those things where we talk more about the network card and the packets, the frames. And so we'll, we'll explain this all in greater detail here in the next module, actually. Uh, we get to check a look at the flags uh, that are being sent um, and things like that. If there's any fragment offset, things of that nature, of course, social destination IP address um, and all that fun stuff that's available uh, that we have there. And uh, that's really, uh, again, really sweet little deal. Nice thing about having tools like this, like Wireshark, is that we don't have to, you know, take a just a look at the hexadecimal and take a guess, or uh, we would really have to know more specifically about, okay, what's this DCC8 mean, you know, um, and uh, and whatnot. So that would, in this case, would be the checksum, like your CRC check type scenario, uh, and so on. So again, lots of uh, information that's out there. When it comes down to the information that we're actually gathering uh, and so forth with that, but even when we're out there doing things, you know, and we're, we're checking things out, a lot of times, again, we're just looking into uh, the information. Okay, where is it coming from? Where is it going to? And, um, you know, what, what's maybe within the, the, the frame itself uh, and such. And make me see if there's something else going on here that is uh, not easily accessible. Uh, to the naked eye, I guess we could say, and such. So again, we'll, we'll break it down a little bit more, and I'll kind of explain a little bit more detail here as we get to um, these hexadecimal numbers. And I'll break it. I'll literally break it down and show you guys what each is so you can make notes and take it from there. All right, so let's hop right into then the module two. Come on.